What's cracking, ladies and gentlemen? 49 coming out your Nazkami Shellcast for the OUSA Dota League Season 2. This is the Group 1 playoffs of Game 3 of Sing 2 up against East Nug. Sing 2 were able to play a very powerful, a decibel lineup up in Game Number 1. We were able to secure a very early 27 minute victory up against East Nug. East Nug then counteracted with an incredibly aggressive lineup of their own. Utilizing an Ursa as well as a Lycanthrope pickup to be able to constantly apply split pushing pressure, as well as a lot of early game uh, ganks and team fights to be able to separate Sing 2 and deprive them of their biggest strength, which is the superior team fight execution, and to instead result them to Rat Dota and split pushing with a force to uh, constantly uh, separate, in which case you could go for pickoffs. So Bat Rider and the Lycanthrope now being banned out by Sing 2. And we've got first pick this time, and once again, Brewmaster and Lone Druid, so they're continuing to respect Ban Pandy. So Pandy, this time he's the drafter as opposed to Valerie. It will be Reserve interesting time. to see what he decides to pick up as his first pick. Titans are still as available, as well as the Faceless Void. But the Faceless Void in the last game wasn't actually able to achieve all too much because they ran Faceless Void in the one position role as opposed to the three position with the Clockwork. And the Clockwork, because he chose to max out the Rocket Flare, while it gave him an easier laning phase, it, didn't, it meant that he wasn't able to contribute to these early ganks. He was spending a lot of time over in the top lane trying to uh, shut down the Lycan Throw. And then sticking with the tree and protect the first pick. Radiant team pick. And East Nug will be interesting to see what Heroes they decide to pick up. The Tree and Protector did help them hold on to the towers for as long as possible. Once again, they're sticking to the guns of the Shadow Shaman. If it ain't broke, don't fix it. Shadow Shaman's been picked up by East Nug all three games now. So once again, going to be played by Tickle Biddies. And the Shadow Shaman Master Open Wards gives you an extra layer of split pushing since you can have Lycanthrope in one lane and the Shadow Shaman in the other, as they did in game number two. Lycanthrope has been banned out this time, so they, but they still have that pushing power coming out from the Shadow Shaman. If Shadow Shaman's able to get a good uh, Master Open Ward trap over one of the heroes in Sing 2, they can instantly decide to fight. Since so you could uh, trap that hero and kill him before anything happens, the Master Open Wards deal a massive amount of physical DPS, especially once you get the Aghanim Scepter upgrade. So really deliberating for their second pick up, they go for the Death Prophet, so once again, East Nug, they're showing their hand very early on, they're going for a lot of Death Ball uh, pushing. And saying too, it's up to them to be able to respond to this, the Tree Protector, he works well against split push and chip damage. He doesn't deal very well when you decide to group up as fire and just take the tower by force. If the tower dies, you can't heal it back up. The Living Armor doesn't give you much while the enemy team is hitting in it. And so Death Prophet going to be over in the mid lane, probably going to be played by by Diablos, who, was, who played the uh, Templar Assassin in the last game. And so Train Protector, you, you have to pick aggressive heroes to synergize well with them. And Train Protector at level 1, if you decide to start with Boots first, well, the Leech Seed can give you a very easy first blood. But you have to capitalize on his early aggressive power, as opposed to relying on the uh, defensive and passive capabilities of the Train Protector to rely on living uh, armor. You instead want to focus more on the offensive capability that Leech Seed gives you. And it's the reason why Alliance like to run the Train Protector and the Io. And so Wisp tethers the uh, Train Protector who runs up, throws out the Leech Seed. The Leech Seed heal because it propagates to both the Train Protector as well as the uh, Wisp the wisp Tether ensures that Train Protector gets healed for twice the amount. And it means that the extra movement speed as well as the snare coming out from the Tether means that the Train Protector can just punch people down to his heart's delight. Ember Spirit being picked up very early on by Sing 2. So we could be seeing a tri-lane uh, Ember Spirit similar to the likes of Horseman the Ruckus or we could be seeing uh, Ember Spirit over in the mid lane but Ember Spirit up against a Death Prophet it's a very easy win for the Death Prophet because uh, Ember Spirit especially with the current meta build where you want to max out that Flame Guard Flame Guard's immediately popped by the Crypt Swarm and without the Flame Guard to provide you the DPS as well as the ability, Death Prophet can just bully you out of lane and you can right click you down with the superior range as well as the superior base damage since Ember Spirit's got one armor and the Crypt Swarm outside of the uh, Flame Guard Ember Spirit is very squishy so all really be able to help him help the death problem control the lane since ember spirit isn't able to kill off the uh, mid lane of creeps faster than the death prophet so it means that he can't contest uh runes unless the supports camp it for him and so he's a very greedy mid lane hero but in that one position role when he comes online much quicker he's able to if he's able to find farm for a very early battle fury he could pre delay the push coming out from the shadow shaman and the death prophet but he that being said up against the death prophet ember spirit has to be very careful because when he uses the slate of fist to be able to defend high ground and you leave the remnant for where you're going to return back to. If the Death Prophet player knows how to uh, knows the uh, timing for the Ember Spirit's Slate of Fist, and it's 0.3 seconds for every unit, he can actually time the Grave Silence right on top of him. If the Ember Spirit's Silence, he's dead in the water. You can instantly blow him up in these fights. Especially since he's incredibly squishy, he's reliant entirely on his mobility and his high range to be able to stay alive in these engagements. And we've got another respect ban for the Visage being played by Valerie, who, despite having a bit of a slow start, was able to create a lot of space for his team, he got a lot of kills, and Viper being banned out by Sing2 immediately, just because he is a hard counter to the Ember Spirit in the laning stage, since the point in the Nether Toxin on two points will then tear through the Ember Spirit and control him in lane, and Corrosive Skin means that the Ember Spirit is always going to be snared up, so he's easy prey, 
And if you're able to catch him out with the Viper Strike, if he drops a remnant after he gets Viper Strike, because it's based off your movement speed, the remnant crawls along, you can easily control and kill the Ember Spirit that way. So that means that the Ember Spirit is forced to preemptively deploy this remnant. That means if he's playing aggressively, it delays the time that it'll take for his remnant to fly out. Tight under being banned out by East Nugs, they're taking no chances, ensuring that they don't have any ways to be able to uh, disrupt these fights and to counter initiate. So Tidehunter is very powerful because he's versatile as an initiator. Very few initiations can also counter initiate. So Tidehunter, if he has a blink tank, he can jump your team if he catches out three or four. You can win a fight off the back of that. Or if you're going to be just trying to siege high ground, you instead send your tankier uh, hero to slow siege. Wait for them to initiate on that hero, and then the Tidehunter blinks them when they group up to try to defend, and then you go for the counter initiation. So he's very powerful in that sense, as well as the fact that he's an incredibly powerful offlane hero, just due to how difficult it is to be able to dislodge him. So Skyrath Mage been picked up the Shadow Shaman, very powerful support duo. The Shadow Shaman compensates for Shadow Shaman's weaknesses, which is a slow movement speed and slow engagement range. So Skyrath Mage cast of shot can help set up the shackles, and since while Sh Shadow Shaman he lacks damage while he's shackling, Skyrath Mage can blow them up with either the Arcane Bolt or later on in the game with the Mystic Flare. And so you've got two very powerful support heroes that are relevant at all stages of the game. Skyrath Mage is also an excellent counter pick to the Ember Spirit. Since if you catch him with the Ancient Seal, Ember Spirit, if he's silenced, he's absolutely dead in the water. He's a glorified melee creep though. Since you can't, Ember Spirit's a carry hero that doesn't want to be in the front line. You always want to be on the sides, you always want to be in the back. You want to be, all your teamfight contribution comes from your Slater Fist. And so, so long as you're able to get Slater Fists off, if you stack enough damage on him, you can win fights decisively just off that. But if you're caught out and not able to disengage, then you're, then the enemy team can easily tear you apart since you're very squishy and very fragile. Timbersaw being picked up, so he's going to be the offlane hero. Timbersaw as well, he's a very powerful offlane hero once he gets the ball rolling, but that's the issue with Timbersaw. He's a very greedy uh, offlane hero compared to heroes such as the Tidehunter or the Clockwork, who are effective from level 1. Timbersaw at level 1 is incredibly easy to gank. Especially against the support duo of the Shadow Shaman and the Skywrath Mage, he's dependent on his reactive armor and his timber chain, because those reactive armor gives him enough EHP and sustain so he can stay on lane, and it means that he's difficult to bring down through physical damage in the early stages, and, and that buys enough time for the timber chain to be able to zip him out. But Skywrath Mage can interrupt that with the Ancient Seal. Ancient Seal is an instant cast point, and so while the timber chain's flying out, you can silence him and interrupt the timber chain. In that case, timber is dead. So the two supports, Shadow Shaman and the Skyrath Mage, have to be playing very aggressively from one to prevent Timbersaw from getting any kind of farm and any kind of experience. Since if Timbersaw is able to get level 6, he can, he deals a huge amount of burst damage. He can, if he catches any of the support heroes out on their own, and Skyrath Mage doesn't have enough mana for the silence, or isn't able to turn around and react in time, Timbersaw can blow him up very quickly with a Whirling Death as well as the uh, Chakram. And so in that regard, Timbersaw is a greedier offlane than the uh, Faceless Void or the Tidehunter or the Clockwork Goblin. But if he does, but he's got much higher, he's got more potential with what he could do with the farm experience. So if you're not able to shut him down, he could do a lot of work. Doombringer still is available in the pool. So East Nug, they're really deliberating with the uh, fourth pickup. They haven't picked up the offlane yet. They've picked up the uh, mid lane hero very early on, as well as the two supports. We could actually also be seeing potentially a dual lane from Sing 2, just to ensure that if Ember Spirit's going mid, that he has an easy time. So Ember Spirit in conjunction with another support hero for. So as somebody with a high engagement range, Skywrath Mage is fantastic for this role because he could constantly appeal, uh, throw out the Arcane Ball. But another hero available that they could perhaps look to do is the Lich, since Lich can constantly control the lane through Sacrifice, as well as by throwing out the Frost Blast to control the Death Prophet. Since otherwise in a 1v1 matchup, Ember Spirit on paper should be completely destroyed by the Death Prophet. Especially since the RTC build where you max out the Searing Chain to Slay the Fist and you win your lane by being able to constantly throw out the Slay the Fist Searing Chain combination on the enemy hero to be able to deal enough dot damage to drive them back and to deal a lot of chip damage to harass them out of lane. And that's being completely phased out with a nerf to Searing Chain as well as the nerf to the Slay the Fist. So now the most efficient build for the Ember Spirit is to max out that Flame Guard. But that doesn't give you that uh, W into Q setup. And so the Slark being picked up, we could be seeing an offlane or a tri lane Slark. Probably going to be Seize to Cheese, going to be playing that Slark, it is one of his preferred heroes. will be interesting to see who does actually pick it up. It could be Captain Taichu, who seems to be playing that one position role. So Sing 2, really deliberating over on their fourth pickup. So it will be interesting to see what hero he decides to, what hero they decide to uh, draft as a fourth pickup, since they haven't picked up their secondary support hero yet, so they might look to pick it up now. So the Ember Spirit and the Tree. And the Train Protector Overgrowth gives Ember Spirit all the time in the world to keep throwing out Slate to Fist. So they go for a Life Stealer. So we're definitely going to be seeing an Ember Spirit mid then. Because Life Stealer, he can operate as a very effective mid lane if a bit unconventional against some lineups. So if you're, it's a, for instance, if it's a Pudge, Life Stealer can go mid and have a very easy time. So against melee mids, Life Stealer has a fairly easy time. 
but against the Death Prophet, he won't be able to really do all too much since if he's popping rage defensively, then the Death Prophet can simply wait out the rage and then keep throwing out the Crypt Swarm on top of that and just poke him around with the 600 range and the higher base damage. The fifth ban, Ancient Apparition. So Ancient Apparition is a train protector, fantastic support duo. You have the Overgrowth is set up for the Ice Blast. If you get Ice Blast on two, three heroes, that wins you the fight. Especially since Slark, he's entirely dependent on the Shadow Dance regen to stay alive in these engagements. And Death Prophet, to a lesser extent, relies on the Exorcist uh, heal at the very end. Ten seconds remaining. Especially if you're able to drag out uh, the fight and prevent Death Prophet's Exorcist from Five really being able to be effective. Remaining. If she pops it very early on, if you're able to delay her until it wears off, and then she's reliant on that heal. Centaur Warren being banned out. So they're banning out potential offlaners to force the Slark to offlane. Since Slark over in the offlane can be controlled fairly easily. If you do pick up a very aggressive hero, they can counteract them. So Disruptor, for instance, works very well against the Slark. Since Slark relies on pouncing away, if Disruptor glimpses him back in, then he's completely screwed. Of course, Slark always can pounce into the trees. If the enemy team doesn't see him pouncing the trees, he can do that to passively leech EXP and win the lane that way if he knows that he's going to be up against a very aggressive kill lane. But you very rarely see this, just because Slark, if he starts with boots and if he has a safety ward, he could constantly be able to pounce himself back to prevent the sports from being engaged on him. But most likely, I mean, you'd prefer to see a one position Slark in the tri lane since you want to get his uh, damage items up as quickly as possible. You want to help out with the ganking, so if he's either going towards the Shadow Blade, which has been phased out by the Blink Dagger, or otherwise if you're going towards the Blink Dagger, you want him to be able to get it as soon as possible. And Ursa Warrior wants to again be picked up, so we're going to be seeing a Slark uh, offlane, and then Ursa Warrior as a tri lane, and with Skywrath Mage and the Shadow Shaman, this is a very dangerous tri lane, and Lion being picked up. Did it provide the controls and provide that burst damage to kill the Slark or the Ursa as soon as possible? So Lambda Driver, who's usually the offlane player, going to be over on the Lion and Pandy this time. We actually could be seeing perhaps some <coughs> a mid Timbersaw. Pandy's the one playing it, but most likely going to be. But in that case, that would be the Ember Spirit in the offlane. Ember Spirit can't offlane all, so it's going to be the Timbersaw in the offlane and the Ember Spirit in the mid lane. We could potentially be seeing a dual lane with the Lion. Or even the train protect with the uh, lion and the ember spirit, but the drawback to that is that means that life is left with a melee support. So if it's if he's against the tri lane, they can play very aggressively against him. So we'll be interested to see how this lane goes. Spooky scary skeleton going to be on the over in the death prophet and Diablos going to be on the slark. So the players from East Nuck, they like to switch it up a lot. So Diablos has played a support a carry Five the um, mid lane physical DPS there, and now he's going to be playing. Potentially the off lane will be interesting to see how they decide to lane this. Gonna introduce the players from both teams. Over in Sing 2, Venali gonna be on the Ember Spirit. Looks like he's going towards the mid lane based on his item build. Sexy. Once again, he's gonna be on the Train Protector, sounding with sentries, as well as Ob, so he's gonna have <laughs> as much a utility as possible. Timbersaw being played by Tandy, gonna be the off lane because they could decide to clash uh, Tri lane and send the Timbersaw over to the top lane, but Ursa Warrior does very well against the Life Stealer since you can't man win a man fight against an Ursa Warrior. And Life Stealer is a hero that relies on man fighting. And Lambda Driver going to be on the line. Well, Goma Goma going to be the Life Stealer. And over for East Nug, Diablo is going to be over in the Slark. We'll be interested to see what lane he chooses to go for. Spooky Scary Skeleton, most likely going mid over on the Death Prophet. Tick All Booties once again going to be the 4 position Shadow Shaman. With Seize the Cheese going to be the 5 position Skywrath Mage. And Captain Taichu going to be over on the Ursa Warrior. We could actually be seeing an off lane Ursa since he's start he is starting with Boots again. Boots first once again. But more, most likely will be. Uh, East Nug clashing try be try, since they know that Ursa Warrior is a much more aggressive carry. Since Lifesteal is a very aggressive carry, and, and he usually relies on that over aggression catching getting by off guard with the open wounds to help set up ganks. But Ursa Warrior is even more aggressive than the Lifestealer, since with Fury Swipes and with the Overpower can out DPS the Lifestealer. And you can just smack him around. He does a massive amount of physical burst damage. Looks like we've got a toilet break. So a quick pause coming up for both teams. <laughs> so the lineup for uh, East Nug. Really favors the mid game. Once the Death Prophet gets a point or two points up in the Exorcism, once the supports have their ultimates up, Skywrath Mage and the Shadow Shaman can make plays on their own. And Skywrath Mage can, if he finds a hero, he can go for a kill attempt with a concussive shot. And the concussive shot with the Ursa Warrior is especially dangerous because Ursa Warrior, especially since they started with boots, any kind of snare becomes incredibly dangerous against an Ursa. Since every hit he deals is further multiplied, and the overpower lets him get a lot of free hits in, and so he has an insane amount of burst power coming up. So the Concussive Shot sets up for either the Ursa Warrior to run in an Earth and get the Earth Shock, or for the Shadow Shaman to come in for the Shackle. But at either rate, if any of the heroes from Sing 2 are caught out of position, they will be immediately dying if they're caught out by that combo. And since, if they decide not to Clash Try, be try if they're going to be going to the safe lane, 
One of those supports probably going to be looking to pull, so the instant one of the supports rotates the pull, and there's two heroes left in the lane, you immediately jump on them, you capitalize, and Veli's going to be having a difficult time over on the uh, mid lane. <laughs> Bit of smack talk coming out. And we've got Sexy actually rotating to the bot lane to get the ward off the of Pandy. We've got Smoke immediately being bought out by Tickle Biddies. And Captain Taichu leading the charge over to the top lane. The Slark up against the Timbersaw. Timbersaw has a decisive advantage against the Slark because of the Whirling Death. But that being said, if Slark plays very aggressively, and if he gets a point over an Essence Shift very early on, like he actually chooses to go for two points in the Essence Shift very early on. He could trade very effectively with the Timbersaw, drain away all the stats. Since Timbersaw has a fairly low mana pool. And Slark, if he gets enough Essence Shift procs, actually deals a sizable amount of damage. So it's a bit of a toss up, but Timbersaw usually does have the advantage just because of the uh, Welling Death, especially against melee heroes since they have to eat it, so you can use it to farm as well as to harass them back. Taichu drops the Sentry Ward safely into the tree, so it makes it very difficult to D Ward to get the block off. Tigo Bleeds is there, looks like they're going for the aggressive train lane. And so it's going to be Pandy up against uh, Spooky Scary Skeleton, so it looks like Diablos is going to the mid lane, so Death Prophet starting with Boots first. So very interesting lanes coming up from them. I really dislike this because the uh, Emma Spirit actually has a very easy time against the Slark. Slark is too squishy. He's constantly going to be eating the burn damage from the Flame Guard. If he's caught out the Searing Chains without the Death Pack, without the Dark Pack, will be taking fall. Since if he catches him out the Searing Chains, Diablos is forced to Dark Pack it off, and he's going to be losing a lot of HP in exchange for that. Since the Flame Guard mitigates all of Slark's damage, all of Slark's damage early on is magic damage, and since he doesn't, he's not going to really get too many right clicks in. And if MS Spirit gets a good enough start, things become very difficult for the boys in E-Snug. So he makes it almost impossible to breach high ground, especially with the uh, potential overgrowth coming out from the Train Protector. You can never count the MS Spirit out. So MS Spirit choosing not to skill up a point yet. Up against Diablo's choice to skill pounce at 1. In some cases in the mid lane and the melee be melee matchup, Essence Shift at 1 can be considered. Because it lets you get a lot of uh, early trip damage. Gomu Gomu playing very far forward, but the two supports are hiding in the trees. They're initiating over Captain Taichu, they have to respond now. He tries to go for open woods, so they know they can turn around on this. They catch him out with the shackles as well as the contestant shot. Lee Steed keeping him alive, Captain Taichu turns a double damage over on Sexy. And he's punching people down. That's one big, bad, angry tree. Unfortunately, he doesn't have boots, so he isn't able to secure the kill. But he does drive Captain Taichu off. And the supports hadn't rotated there, that could have ended in an absolute disaster. Lambda Driver spots out the ward being placed, so he's got a sentry, he should be able to instantly deward down he is. So the safety ward being deprived, and Gomu Gomu, he's off to fairly slow stuff, but over in the bottom lane, Pandy is absolutely destroying the Death Prophet. Since, especially since Death Prophet's not in the mid lane, which he could rely on either bottle crying or by uh, room control. As an off lane hero, she tapers off quite by quite a large amount, just because she's so dependent on the bottle to be the sustain herself in lane, so she's reliant entirely on Crypt Swarm to be the control lane, find a farm, and to be the ensure rune control. But and when you can't do that in the off lane, things go very badly. You would have preferred to send the Slug, even if the Slug loses to the Timber Sword, because you you need to your Death Prophet to have a good start. And you want to make sure that the Timber Sword gets some kind of pressure placed on him. Since he's a taking Tide Bomb, once he hits level 6, if he's able to get a very early Arcane Boots, he can go around for a lot of kills and create a huge amount of space for his team. The so Captain Taichu, he's finding his farm though. And the advantage of this is the life stealer. He's actually got zero CS. Goma Goma has to play very passively. He's got a point up in rage now. So he could at least purge off the concussive shot coming out from him. And we've got Ward Wars happening. A Cease of Cheese goes for a few right clicks over in the century. Well, he's about to deal with it. Never mind. It actually looks like Lambda Driver tries to skill Hex at one. And he's going to be taking more. He, turn, he turns around for the Hex. Leech has been used on him. Tickle Base is there as well for the Shackle. And that ensures the kill with the Arcane Bolt there for good measure. Tickle Beast gets the first blood, so that means early boots up on him. They immediately place another ward, even though there's a sentry being placed there. So that observer, that safety ward is going to be dewarded out fairly soon. And the mid lane, Diablos, he eats Searing Chains. Valerie is having a very good time. He knows He's actually chosen to go for the Arteezy build. So this is very rare. The reason why you don't see this is no longer as efficient. Because uh, the Searing Chains, the Slider Fist story has been nerfed. So it, does 100, it does 40 damage less than it used to. And so because it only does 80 damage, and the damage has been cut in half uh, by a third. It means that early points in this area and the Slight of Fist aren't as effective because before having an extra 120 damage on demand every 6 seconds was a huge amount so it helped you go for these kill attempts. But now the more cost efficient uh, DPS build is to max out the Flame Guard. But the advantage of this is with the Staring Chains now, so that you need 3 points in it for it to deal uh, 2 seconds for it to be a uh, deal 240 damage, you need 2 points in it for it to be a uh, 2 second snare and 4 points in it for, for it to be a, a 3 second snare which is what it used to be. The advantage of this is it gives you a lot more ganking potential. 
And so Ember Spirit, he's got to be very careful though, because there's a smoke rotation. He does pick up a, a uh, Envis Rune, and there's no sentries up on the supports. So unfortunately, the smoke rotation might be completely wasted. Captain Taichu, he's been left alone in the meanwhile. So going in for the Ganga Tap now on Velody, but he's got that Invis Rune, throws out the Searing Chance, actually turns around to Slay the Fist, he turns into a chicken now, but he was able to get that Invis Rune off in time, and that waste time of him, and Captain Taichu, he has to be very careful, Lambda Driver, going for a kill attempt, but Captain Taichu pops his overpower, and Lambda Driver has to be very afraid, he's only got the Hex, and the Hex is on cooldown, and supports are now rotating back to the top lane, Gomu Gomu has found some recovery farm, but he's only got 3 CS up on the life steal, as a hero is dependent on having a good early game, the entire hero is built around getting ahead and staying ahead, but Pandia in the bot lane, if he gets enough farm, he can create a lot of spaces, almost level 6, compared to uh, Death Prophet, has just hit level 5, Pandy is dominating this off lane. So they're winning uh, 2 out of 3 lanes, it looks like they've broken even now. The pressure being placed on the supports means that uh, Valley has the same amount of CS as the Slark. And Slark no is actually is usually the better ganker in the early stage, but Valley gone for the RTZ build, can actually set up a lot of kills for his teammates. Look at the advantage of the RTZ build, is you can never count out the uh, 8 second on demand Slater Fist and Saren Chen combinations. Diablos takes a lot of damage on these team fights. If he's ignored on these early gank, he could set up for the Life Seal to be a deal all his damage and for the Timber Saw. Since the Immobilize means that the Chakram will always be able to hit, and Life Seal is always able to get these free shots in. Barely drops a very aggressive remnant early on. We've got a 5 minute Arcane Boot, so Pandy is farming up a storm, but Captain Taichu over the top lane. Because the enemy team is so afraid of him. And because Gomu Gomu can't go too close to the Creek Blade, he actually tries to start with a Quelling Blade. You usually never want to start with a Quelling Blade on the Life Stealer unless there's a Nature's Prophet, just because you have such high base damage and because you have uh, such a great attack animation. And especially when you're not even able to go close to the Creek Blade, the Quelling Blade is, is completely wasted. You could have gone for more stats, or you could have rushed towards your Hand of Minus or towards your Face Boots. Barely dropping another remnant defensively this time. He needs to be playing a lot more aggressively with the Slater Fist Serian Chain combination. To be there, try to keep uh, Diablos low, catching them out with the Searing Chains, but Diablos, he's level 6 now, so he's got the Shadow Dance. Sexy, going for a pull, but Taichu says thanks for that, buddy, I'm gonna just take those creeps. Choosing to max out Fury Swipes once again, pops the Overpower, immediately forces out the Hex, and they can go for a rotation, go move, Earth Spike flies out on him, pops the Rage, but he's man fighting up against Earth, so you do not want to fight the bear, the bear will hug you down. Living out and keeping you alive for a bit longer, Lambda Driver, then they're doing what he can, Arcane Ball, he's calling it up, turning the chicken, that's gonna be two kills over in the tri lane. As East Nug, once again, off the back of some impressive play coming up from Captain Taichu, uh, able to win the tri lane. And Veli in the mid lane, doing what he can to try to control Diablos, but Diablos, with the constant uh, Shadow Dance regeneration, it's going to be difficult. Veli can never go from kill attempt unless the Slark misplays. Slay the Fist, unfortunately, not able to land Searing Chains, and with the defensive remnant placed preemptively, he's able to win the Rune Race, and Diablos with the Shadow Dance Regeneration, should be able to go back up to full. Can maybe think to go in for a turnaround, at least get a few cheeky right clicks in. But Valerie should be having a fairly uh, easy time. He can always Remnant out, since the Pounce isn't going to be able to prevent him from being a Remnant, so uh, neither of the mid heroes can really go for a kill attempt, unless the enemy uh, player makes a mistake, but Diablos instead, he's going to rotate. He might actually be able to spot out Lambda Driver, who's level 2, up against level 7, so like, he spots him out, also spots out Gomu Gomu, he's been fleeing back to his base, and Land the Driver, he's been spotted out. Diablos, he's paying the rest of his team. Looks like he's going for a stack. Sexy is there to prepare to provide the uh, tr living armor, but the invisibility rune wears off, and he just barely misses Sexy. And in the mid lanes, Valley is able to get a lot of farm while all this is happening. But Pandy still continuing to lead the CS scoreboards as well for denies. Level 7, now almost level 8, he's got. He actually goes in for a kill attempt from a spooky scary skeleton with the timber chain. Start things off. Chakram lands, whirling death. He should be able to get this with the secondary timber chain. Unfortunately, it doesn't latch. Spooky scary skeleton chooks him through with utilizing the unit walking. Living armor keeping Pandy alive. Support finally rotates him from Captain Taichu. Exorcism also being forced, but Pandy, he's got the timber chain, so he actually he's got to be very careful. He doesn't have enough mana. But Taichu's able to get a few right clicks in. But with two points up in the reactive armor, Taichu can't really dive just to go for a kill. And Exorcism has been used by Spooky Scary Skeleton at such low HP, so not to waste Exorcism in exchange, as well as a TP rotation. And so Gomu Gomu in the top lane, he's thanking uh, Gaiman right now, since so he's able to find as much farm as possible. Going for a very uh, aggressive build, tries to go for 2 points up in Feast. I disagree with the skill, but you only need 1 point in Feast in the early stage of the game. You want to max out Rage, all the open wounds. In this case, since you're playing so far from behind, maxing out the Rage will give you a lot of uh, utility. Regen Room being picked up, so Veli's going to be able to pick that up. Taichu rotates over to the jungle. He's going to be the, the Vladimir carrier for his team. And I suppose Death Prophet will... Like, he's going towards the uh, Yule Scepter as quickly as possible. So once again, it's going to be supports. They're going to be building the Mechanism. 
And that's the biggest issue that I have with the team. Timbersaw can choose to go for the mechanism, but he's going to instead going for the arcane boots and the bloodstone. And the life dealer sure as hell isn't going for a mech anytime soon, especially with the two supports being so low. Sees the cheese, reveals himself to Valerie, forced to play a little bit back. With the max out slate of fist, he could try to uh, he could continuously apply chip damage. If it wasn't the slot, if it was any other mid here. And actually, while I say that, Spooks here skeleton takes the falls, panties able to clean him up. And that's a ticking time bomb with the Timbersaw, since he wasn't contested at all. And since so they weren't able to get a gank attempt, once he's able to get a few points up in his ultimate, once he gets his arcane boost, he becomes very dangerous. But Diablo at the same time, Slark is also being a ticking time bomb. He chooses to go for a hand of Midas, looks like he's holding his gold, so it might be the case. Midas on Slark is a fairly questionable item, since you want to snowball with the Slark, and the Midas doesn't really help you snowball, so it doesn't help you gank. He's still incredibly squishy, it does give you the attack speed, which is very nice. And it helps you out in the later stages of the game. So, but Slark as a late game hero isn't really awfully effective unless you're very far ahead. You want to win the mid game with the Slark and try to get so far ahead that the enemy team doesn't have time to recover. Especially if you're going for uh, if you have a, a very powerful pushing lineup. So the Ursa as well as the Shadow Shaman and the Death Prophet give you a lot of pushing power. And the Skyrath Mage helps you out with this by ensuring that you win these engagements by being a shutdown either the Timbersaw or the uh, Ember Spirit. But one pass damage of the Chakram. And Tiggle, but he's has forced to back out. Spooky Scary Skeleton, now he's over in the top lane. So he's... But Goma Goma has actually recovered very nicely. He's able to pick up uh, 20 CS. So he, was, oh, he only had 3 CS about 4 minutes into the game. Captain Taichu is going for Roshar. He's got the Morbid Mask to give him that sustain. The Sexy, he's spawning it out. He can actually go look to contest them. And Pandy's also there. The Chakram Pass Damage will be enough for you to kill him off. And he feeds another death over to Pandy. This is the drawback of being on the Radiant side as opposed to the Dire. And... Valerie actually chooses to go for Arcane Boots as opposed to Phase Boots. This is something that used to be a pseudo common pickup. It wasn't unheard of to go Arcane Boots over on the Ember Spirit, but when you go, but that was when you go for the uh, Flame Guard build. When you go for the uh, Slay the Fist RTZ build, you want to go for Phase Boots because you're not using, you're not going through enough mana for it to really be all too effective. Valerie actually could be taking more damage. Remnant's out. Diablos with the Haste Rune is chasing him down, and with no more mana on the Ember Spirit, unless the TP support is there, Sexy is hanging around. Sharkham completely whiffs, land the drivers ready, willing, and able. Turns uh, Diablos into a frog, but with that haste rune, it's a very fast frog, and with the haste and the uh, uh, rune used up, as well as the uh, hex and the earth spike, Lambda doesn't have enough mana to be able to use any of his abilities. He's got earth spike cooling off in two seconds, so he can turn around on Diablos, but Diablos, I don't think they'll have enough damage to be able to kill him off. Using the mana drain instead, good recognition coming up from Lambda Driver, since if he deprives Slark of his mana, he can't really do all too much. And in the bottom lane, take all biddies. He wishes he had Arcane Boots, because he would have had enough to be able to drop the Mass Serpent Wards. Land the Driver with the Mana Pot, able to restore himself back into good fashion. You want to go for Face Boots over on the Emissary if you're going for the RTZ build, because it gives you more damage and more chasing capability. Well, I say that. Tickle, but he's actually called out by the Emissary, so Valerie gets a free kill. The advantage of the Arcane Boots is it means you can constantly spam out your Slater Fist and Serian Chain combination, but you want the extra damage as well as the extra chasing ability. But that being said, the Arcane Boots, it does give you a lot of harassment capability, so you can't stay in lane against the Ember Spirit. And it'll be interesting to see what item you choose to go for. You usually want to go Phase Drum into the uh, Battle Fury. But with the Arcane Boots, the reason why you go for the Drums is to provide you the increased mana pool as well as the increased HP pool. But with the Arcane Boots, you can actually choose to rush the Battle Fury, but that being said, Battle Fury also provides a mana regeneration to ensure that you don't really need to go, go for the Arcane Boots. Well, I say that Diablos, caught out of position, gets caught out with the Searing Chain as well as the Slater Fist and Searing Chain combination. Chakram, latches, Slater Fist latches as well. We could have waited two more seconds so we had the Searing Chain combination on top of that. The dot damage might have been enough to be an ensure a kill, but they're immediately forced off. And a 9 minute hand of Midas on Slark might actually be too much greed for uh, East Nug. So it really delays their uh, ganking and pushing power at the moment. And while all this is happening, Lifestealer, he's recovered. He's picked up every, almost every single CS ever since they've left him alone. And so now he's got 43 CS, so he's actually recovered very nicely. Death Prophet, very low CS up on her. Actually, Tickle Biddies is a fair amount of CS, considering the fact that he's a 4 position hero. Also has to be rotating a lot. Seize the Cheese has to be very careful, he's eating a lot of tower hits. He can't re-engage now, because if he's caught up by Slave to Staring Chain combination, he will actually die. Diablo is very low. No mana to use the Shadow Dance. Spooky Scary Skeleton committing for this. So the Mass Serpent Wards and the Exorcism are there. If they don't get this tower, that's a huge expenditure of resources for very little return. Slave Fist Staring Chain combination unfortunately doesn't latch since the Creep Wards was also there. There's a huge search radius for the Staring Chains. It's the only way to really balance the ability. Arcane Boots now up on Tickle Biddies. And Captain Tychus, he's in the mid lane. He's going to try to pressure the Tail 1 in the mid lane <coughs> while this is happening. 
the tail one, the bottom lane, sees the cheese. It looks like he rotated the top, but he has to be very careful. If the life stealer catches him out on his own, open wounds, rage, run up and smack him down. Looks like he's going for a split build where he wants to go for two points over in the uh, cane ball as well as two points over in the ancient seal. You usually choose to max one or the other. In this game, against the heroes like a Timbersaw and the Ember Spirit, you want to max out the Ancient Seal as soon as possible, especially if you want to be playing a lot more aggressively. So if it was the Timbersaw in the off lane, up against the tri lane, you want to max out the Ancient Seal. Otherwise, if you're playing very aggressively in the Tri-Tri situation, you want to go for a point over in the Arcane. But while I say this, Spooky Scary Skeleton, he's got to be very careful. Shackle, however, uh, overlap with his Grave Silence. I could have timed that a bit better. Spooky Scary Skeleton actually dies to creeps as Paddy is able to clean up another key. He gets a double kill off the back of that. Captain Tai True, Saren Chain. As well as the Slate of Fist combination, that's the advantage of the Arteezy build, as it lets you kite around the Ursa. He throws it out once again, and the uh, Chalkrim as well as the Whirling there cleans him off. It's a triple kill over on Pandy. And the ticking time bomb with the Timber Sword is now blowing up in your face. It's starting to do a lot of damage over that tail on the bottom lane. And while all this is happening, Gomu Gomu, he's racing up a storm. Looks like he's going for Sanjin Diyasha, so he's going for the race car build to the old school YYF build. Still chose to max out Feast. Very questionable build order coming out from the Life Stealer. You max out either the Rage or the Open Wounds. So Open Wounds gives you the ability to be able to start these uh, ganks on your own. So your support, you're not reliant on your supports to be able to set it up for you. You can phase boot yourself forward, Open Wound, and your supports rotate in. Gives you a lot more solo killing power as well. Otherwise you max Rage if you're playing defensively, or if you know that your supports can constantly lock them in place. So the extra attack speed from the Rage gives you a lot more overall DPS. But maxing out Feast gives you very little. It's only a 3% increase in the life steal you get, and you're only getting that if you're hitting full HP creeps, since you're only going to be hitting half HP or like very low HP creeps to ensure that you get the last hit. Unless you're neutraling, it doesn't really give you all too much. I suppose because he has such a rough time, it does give him the capacity to recover his farm by jungling. But life steal is still a very slow jungler. In the mid lane tower, Diablos checking away there, but the living armor bringing it back up. They really should be focusing more on the bottom tower. Because you never want a living armor a tower that's being hit by heroes. Just because they're able to burn off the living armor charges. And in that case, you're not really getting any benefit from it. But Caesar Cheese, he's been giving a lot of space now. Now he has his Mystic Flare. So they've got their full uh, arsenal of spells available for all of their heroes. Exorcism is up for Spooky Scary Skeleton, but because he wasn't in the mid lane, his farm isn't as good as you'd like, and he's died twice to Pandy. He was level 11 compared to the level 9 uh, death prop. He actually could be going for a solo kill attempt right now. Tickle Biddies is waiting in the wings. But Lambda Driver is also there. Level 6 ups, a finger of death available. He actually runs in, turns him into a, into a frog. Well, he's turned, well, Paddy turns him into a chicken. Two man Earth Spike actually turns that with the finger of death. Instantly kills our spooky, scary skeleton. So he's not too afraid of the skeleton. The uh, Arteezy, Slender Fist, and Sarah Chain combination sets up a double kill for Pandy. Sees the cheese also is dead. It's valid. He's gonna have that combo for one more second. Doesn't even need it. Caught out with the Earth Spike. And that's a triple kill over on Pandy. And the tail one of the bottom one's gonna be taking it for. E Snug. They left Timbersaw alone for too long. This is a common mistake that a lot of teams need to make against the Timbersaw. If you don't shut him down early, he's going to destroy your entire team. With the start that he's had, with that tower last hit, you'll have enough of his Bloodstone. It's a 16 minute Bloodstone, and when your slot goes for a Hand of Midas, which gives you very little uh, ganking or fighting ability, if you went for a Blink Dagger or a Shadow Blade, he'd at least be able to set up these kills. He could at least rotate over and try to go for these kills over on the Timbersaw. And Gomu Gomu, who had such a poor start, has now recovered very nicely. It's, 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 their other two lanes have recovered. The net creating space for him. And so the Ember Spirit, in this case, I'm loving uh, the decision making coming up from Radley. So he knows that he was expecting the enemy team to. The enemy team ex was expecting him to go for more of a greedy farming build, where you go for the Flame Guard, and when you try to go go for the phase drama to the Battle Fury. But instead, because he went for the Arcane Boots, because he went for the Arteezy build, he could constantly be up in the enemy's face. He can help set up kills for the rest of his team. And looks like he's actually going towards what could be a Desolator. It could also be a BKB if he wants to play it safe. With the Max Desolator Fist build, he, could, he doesn't have to be using get. He can play very far back and still set up kills. So it could be a Desolator, and an early Desolator on Ember Spirit is absolutely devastating. Just because every Slater Fist applies the negative 7 armor debuff from the Desolator. And when the enemy team has very low armor, the only hero with fairly high armor is the Ursa, and even then, not too much. Slark has very low armor because he's got such terrible stat growth. And the other heroes in the team, Skyrath Mage and the Shadow Shaman especially, they have such low armor and low HP that Slater Fist will re eventually reach the point where you just one shot or two shot them. Captain Taichu, no uh, land is offering up on him. So he's, despite having such a good early game, he hasn't really been able to keep up on pace, and he has died a fair few amount of times. Whereas Gomu Gomu, now running through the jungle, finding his farm, looks like he's got the completed Yasha flying out towards him, so Sanjin Yasha up on him. 
Now that Lefty has a Sanjin Yashi, can go for a lot of solo kills, and Diablos has to be very careful. He's got Shadow Dance, it looks like he's going building towards the Shadow Blade. Catch the pounce over on Valley, unfortunately. He uses the Shadow Dance, but Valley should be able to chase him down. If he's able, since he can predict where he's moving, Pounds wears off. Slightly first Sanjin combination is now available, but Pounce is out just in time. And he's going for the very greedy Shadow Blade. Shadow Blade's an item you need by the 20 minute mark, and you want to make kills with it. If you get, the reason why you want to get so early on is that's when the enemy team, they're not going to have enough money for Dustal Sentries, or if you force them to go for Dustal Sentries, you're depriving them of the core item. And it also means they're low enough HP that the 150 backstab damage you get from the Shadow, uh, Shadow Blade, as well as the Pounce and the Dark Pack combination, means you could kill heroes before they can get a spell off. And if you kill them very quickly, you're able to snowball off the back of that, so you keep them down while you continue to get further ahead. He will be getting it before the 20 minute mark, but because there's a living armor available, I don't really know how effective this pickup is going to be. Charcom flies out, unfortunately, completely worth staring Chain Slayer for his combination armor, and Diablo so just pounces away. Captain Tai Chu has to be very careful since being controlled so effectively by Slayer for the staring Chain combination. Mystic Flare being used, unfortunately, doesn't do deals full duration over in Pandy, just walks his way through it. Tower takes the fall to take all biddies, but two man slay the first Saren check combination as well as the overgrowth. Spooky scary skeleton and Tickle Biddies immediately take a pop, sees a cheese, tries to TP back home. Paddy's absolutely gone like finger of death being used on the Slark who just popped Shadow Dance. Good for the Radiant. And things are looking very dire for the boys over in East Nug. As Gomu Gomu, he's recovered very nicely. He's actually ahead now in terms of net worth. Pandy, who's a godlike, over on the Timber Store with 12 charges over on the Bloodstone, not even at the 20 minute mark. He's reached the point of critical mass, it's incredibly difficult to bring him down now. Especially with the fact that they don't have a maxed out Ancient Seal. And the Grave Silence is very difficult to land on a highly mobile Pandy unless you lock him down first. He's also tanky enough with the maxed out reactive armor that I don't think they can actually kill him unless they use everything they have. In which case, Gomu Gomu runs up in your face and Valady says, What's up? Continue to lock people in place. So Valady, in this case, he's, an, he's more of a utility uh, Ember Spirit. He's still providing huge amounts of damage and huge amount of ganking capability, but he's setting up for Pandy and for Gomu Gomu to be able to deal damage. But now that he's got his Desolator, he's also dealing a, a mass amount of physical DPS as well. And they're going for an easy Roshan kill. Gomu Gomu, Feast unfortunately doesn't work on Roshan, so he's actually taking a lot of damage. If they choose to contest this, Roshan's actually turned to a fish. So I guess it turns him into a fish and everybody else into a frog. In terms of the gold graph. 5,000 gold lead in favor of the boys from Sing 2, so the Thailand boys, and 10,000 EXP lead, and 10,000 EXP lead, 20 minutes into the game. That's when things start to reach the point of no return. That being said, uh, the boys from East Nung, they can turn this around through split push. They've got the Death Prophet as well as the Shadow Shaman, and they continue to avoid Sing 2 and try to nibble away at the towers and try to drag the game out. At least until they pick up their next set of items. Diablos goes in before a YOLO dive. He knows that Roshan's on here. However, blew his Shadow Dance. So now it's no longer available in the fight. Timbersaw picks it up. So Pandy, you thought he was hard to kill before. Now he's got an Aegis on top of that. Speaking of Scary Skeleton, use the Exorcism. It looks like he's actually caught up the first Aaron Chain combination. Pandy decides to initiate into this. He decides not to. Captain Taichu, he's only just picked up his Lady's offering. Looks like he's building towards a 4 staff to give himself that uh, gap closing mechanism. And the top tower sees the cheese. Trying to tip away at a tail one, but he doesn't have any pushing capability on his own. And a life stealer incredibly fun. Hyperstone up on him. Could be going towards the Soul Karas or the Molnir. Either or are great pickups. Actually, both are great pickups on him. Especially if you go one after the other. But most likely going to be going towards that Soul Karas because it gives your team a lot more sustainability. It gives you a lot more damage. Especially since you've got the Desolator flying out on the Ember Spirit. He could also be going towards a BKB. But no, it's a, that's definitely a Desolator with the second Mithril Hammer. Slark has the Shadow Blade, but it's a, it's too little too late. The support heroes on their team, Lion will die immediately to a combo unless he gets uh, train armored. Handy doesn't really give a damn, he could tank it up. He's got HP for days, especially with the EHP coming in from the reactive armor. And he's got a Boots of Travels up, as well as the Aegis. He is incredibly stacked, and even if you do kill the Timber Sword, and now he's got the Boots of Travels, he's got the Aegis, and if you kill him through the uh, Aegis, so if you kill him twice, he can simply, he'll be back in the fight before you know it with the 12 charges, and he can BOT to a creep and re-engage. And so you're going to have to kill Timbersaw three times in the next fight when Aegis is up, and that's going to make it incredibly difficult for uh, East Nug to be able to turn the game around. Train Protector, he's farming up over in the bottom lane. He's got, almost got a 4 staff, so not going to a Blink Dagger this time. For us, his team a lot more utility, and it's a good pickup, especially against the Ursa Warriors, since you can cut him around. So Ember Spirit working very well up against the Ursa Warriors, since until Ursa gets a BKB, he can continue to lock in place in the Slate of Fisterian Chain combination. If you catch out any of the supports, they're immediately dead. And this is the reason why Ember Spirit was considered a first, ban, uh, first pick hero before his nerf. 
It's just because he had so much utility. He was a ganking hero. He was a carry hero that also ganked very effectively. Four stop into the Hex over in Diablos, as well as the uh, Earth Spike Finger that's going to be committed as well. Unfortunately, just wasn't enough, but Tandy's able to clean it up since the Shadow Dance makes it very obvious where he's rotating towards. Could it should have actually used the Shadow Blade to keep himself alive for a bit longer. Might, might have actually survived. Rayleigh with the Life Stealer Bomb over on Taichu. Actually running very far forward. He's going to be very careful. Taichu should be able to clean him up. Chose not to use the Slater Fist Searing Chain combination. And Taichu should be taking a fall with Gomu Gomu to get that one more right click in. And Valley chose to initiate the Slater Fist Searing Chain combination and then remnant himself in. So for the Life Stealer Bomb, that he would have stayed alive through that. But otherwise, when you get too close to the Ursa Warrior, his bear hug breaks your ribs. Timbersaw looks like he's going towards... Yeah, he picked up a plate mail and then picked up an ultimate orb, so it looked like he was he wanted to go towards a Sheevas guard, and then changed his mind side he wanted to go for a sheep stick. And so a sheep stick coming out on Pandy is gonna be absolutely terrifying. Since Timberstall doesn't have to build anything but survivability and utility, and right now he's got all the survivability in the world, they can't bring him down if, even if they wanted to. So now you build utility, you give them a reason to want to kill you or to at least draw fire away from Gomu Gomu. And so if you pick up a hex for your team, you're giving your other two calls and a lot of time to be there, and a lot of time and a lot of space to be able to deal damage. And it also increases your damage as well. Because it makes it very easy for you to be able to set up your chakra and pass damage. Especially in conjunction with your whirling death and your timber chain. And so it gives you a, it does a lot of work for your team. So this timber soul pickup, it's the straw that broke the camel's back. They weren't able to shut him down. And when you don't shut down a timber soul, when he gets off to a great start like the, the one that Panny's had, he can take over a game and start to run away. Spooky scary skeleton. He's going towards phase drums into the Yule Scepter. He's got the Yule Scepter up, but this Death Prophet pickup actually hasn't accomplished anything. They haven't taken all too many towers, considering the fact that they've got Shadow Shaman and the Death Prophet. If Death Prophet was mid and Diabolus was in the bottom lane, they would have been the lane. They would have had a lot more uh, ability to be able to recover in the mid stage, since they could group up and take their tail one tower in the mid lane immediately. Diabolus caught up with the Earth Spike as well as the Hex. He's able to a Shadow Blade and pounce himself out to safety, but just barely keeping himself alive. Looks like he's going towards a Sanj. So really needed a BKB, especially against this lineup, but chose instead to go for the Sarge. Very questionable decision making coming up from Diablo, since he went for items that... I mean, the Sarge and Yasha or the Heaven Talbot is very effective if you get it early on, but the later the game goes, the less effective it becomes. Because since he went for a Midas, he needs to go for late game items, as opposed to mid game items. So when you go for a Midas, you're forfeiting your early game in exchange for a superior mid to late game. Speaking Scary Skeleton, Yule Scepter's himself up, Pandy should be able to blow him, unfortunately he's caught up on a Mystic, Mystic Flag completely whips, Ancient Seal up on him, Overgrowth latches over on uh, Diablos, Exorcism being used, even though he's very low HP, so questionable play coming out from Spooky Scary Skeleton, Exorcism ends when you die, and so you never use it when you're at low HP, you always want to use it when you're at full HP, Valerie now has the uh, Desolator up, as well as a regen rune, so he could slow siege and tank as much damage as possible, Gomu Gomu looks like he's got a Soul Karas up, so now he's very hard to kill, and he hits incredibly hard, and immediately rotating over to the bottom tier too. The gold lead is now reaching the point of no return. It's only seven thousand. It's only about nine thousand gold lead. Probably will be about eleven thousand once that tower falls. But the fourteen thousand exp lead. That's really what's screwing them up. Shadow Shaman almost has level two mass serpent wards. But Valerie, he's level fourteen. He's got he's got almost all of his abilities maxed out. And he's level seventeen. So that level three chakra doing so much work. Lion's got a level two finger of death, which deals an extreme amount of damage. Especially when the when all heroes over on uh, East Nag have such low HP. Sees the cheese has to be very careful. East the chakram pass damage that takes out almost all his life. The so two thirds of his life gone on one chakram pass. Diablos goes very far forward. Slam first staring chain combination. Unfortunately, doesn't latch. Sexy four steps himself forward as the overgrowth was coming off cooldown. And Captain Taichu, he's Vladimir's offering. He picked up the uh, staff of Whispery. Looks like he sold it. So it could have been a misfire coming out from him. So he's going towards the BKB, but even once he does get the BKB, the Overgrowth will still be able to control him. And the Ursa, when your Ursa is being kited around by two very highly mobile cores, he's not so effective. He's an excellent counter pick up against Lifesteal. Lifesteal did have a very difficult uh, laning stage, but he was able to recover just off the back of how well Valley and uh, Pandy were able to do. So Spooky Scary Skeleton, he should've, the Death Prophet should have been in the mid lane. Barely throws out Slater for second chain combination, almost kills Seize Cheese. Chakram on top of that is enough to kill him. And with negative 6 armor, Skyrath Mage can't even that Slater Fist without dying. And Mr. Slater Fist second chain combination, over on Barely, over on Spooky Scary Skeleton, who's then fingered by Lambda. And they should be able to breach high ground off the back of this. Especially considering the fact that Aegis unfortunately has worn off. But they do have 16 charges up on Pandy. And he has enough for a sheep stick. 
And the mid lane, Captain Taichu, he knows I can't defend this, so he's at least trying to do some split push. Pandy, he's tanking it up, he's got... 36 armor up, and then Overgrowth catches on 2, take off, but he's forced to use massive open ones in a very bad situation. Joy uses the shackles, and this is the captain with a hex, and Pandy blows him up to Temper Chain, Sarah Chain combination. Temper Chain to the Whirling Death, Diablo has been caught up with the open winds of Smackdown, sees the cheese completely with the Mystic Flare, and caught up with the <laughs> Temper Chain as well as the Whirling Death, and suddenly bring it down. Captain Taichu gets a retaliatory kill over on Sexy, Pandy tanks the 3, they're more than happy to lose that, they were able to get a kill over on Valerie as well. But the Master Open Wards unfortunately aren't really able to defend the tier 3, and so they should be the breach high ground off the back of this. Taichu is trying to defend this. Spooky Series Skeleton is there as well. Throws out the silence, he actually gets a great silence on 3. So Gomu Gomu backs away. You'll have to up on him, but, but when he comes back off, he's got Rage as well as Open Wards. He actually could have turned around there. Master Open Wards is worn off. Exorcism going to be wearing off. The boys from Sing 2, they're playing it very safe. They know they're, they're ahead. The only way they could lose this game is if they throw. So they're playing it safe. Backing off now that they know that they've lost the advantage, at least in terms of the immediate team fight, and they know that they're just going to wait out until their next set of vaults are up, until Roshan's up, and then and go for a very safe and very secure uh, high ground breach. Pandy, he's got a sheep stick up on him. He is obscenely stacked. He'll be having a sheep's guard up as well, and about a thousand four hundred more gold. So they're starting to chill out for three, four more minutes while they wait for Roshan to spawn. You're going to be having Timbersaw has got a sheep stick and a completed sheep's guard. So he could single-handedly de decide these fights. If he gets a good Hex off over on Captain Taichu or on Slark before they could get off their BKB or their uh, Dark Pact, and then the rest of the team can follow up and blow him up. Slark going for an SNY, which is a purely mid-game item. You go for an SNY when you're ahead in the early game, and when you want an item to help you dominate the mid-game. So for instance, Juggernaut and lane, you get a lot of kills in the lane stage. You pick up an SNY, so it gives you a lot more uh, powerful mid-game. Otherwise, if you build an SNY, especially when you're behind, it gives you very little. Since it gives you, it's very efficient in the stats that it gives you, since it gives you movement speed, the snare, as well as the stats. But it's a mediocre item in the sense that that's 4,000 gold that you could have spent on the BKB. That would give you a lot more survivability against this lineup. Or you could have gone for a lot more killing power. With 4,000 gold, you could have finished the Cranium Basher for 3,000. So with the Shadow Blade and the Cranium Basher, not the best setup on the Slark, especially when you're playing from behind, but it would have given you a lot more than the SNY. SNY is a snowball item that you want to get when you're ahead and to help you keep it, uh, stay ahead. When you're playing it from when you're trying to play catch up, it doesn't really give you much. It's a waste of gold. Hex is being committed to control the tier 1 tower. Takes the ball over the top lane. Control. Looks like the entire team for East Nug in the top lane. Aside from the Sky Wrath, man, so sees Cheese. He drew the short straw. He's gonna instantly die out if he's caught out of position. Goma Goma is actually invisible. He actually spots out Cease Cheese. Goes too far forward. Open wind's being used. The custom trial is he gonna do anything. And with fortification, I've got fortification up, so they'll be able to TP back in time, but they're choosing to trade this. They're trading a set of racks in exchange for a tier 2. But the issue with this is Sing 2 can decide to take another set of racks if you're not careful. While they don't have uh, the good pushing lineup that East Nug have, they have the item advantage. And actually, they're starting to trade racks for racks. Valerie's retreated over. Called out with the Blink Hex coming up from uh, Take Old Biddy, so he was able to uh, finish a Blink Dagger. <laughs> Looks like we're going to be seeing a base race. Slug actually gets taken out by the line. He's able to finger him down. Captain Taichu used the BKB. He now TP's back, but it's too late. TP's being cancelled. Tickle Biddy's called out. And Spooky Scare Scouts as well. He's TPing it out. Back out, but he will be DPS down before he's able to get back. That's another set of racks. They gave away for nothing. No, they lost. They're going to take two towers in exchange for a racks and a half, as well as two buybacks. Things are very happy to take that trade. They know that with one set of racks down, it's difficult to push out the bottom lane, so that means that the only lanes have to worry about is the mid lane and the top lane, and so if you split pushing top, they just push down mid, and they should be able to take your racks before you do. Or they can split push through top and lead mid, so they've got a tattoo up to provide that extra buffer. Timbersaw has 20 bloodstone charges up, as well as a blink dagger now, so he just has a casual plate now, giving him a lot more survivability. They force out two buybacks, and they're backing off now, they know that the ball is in, is in the enemy team's court if they want to win this game. They've already done enough to secure them the late game. 15,000 gold lead in favor of Sing 2, and looks like about a 17,000 uh, EXP lead. Pandy, MVP for this match, able to turn the entire course of the game around with some assistance from Valerie. Valerie now building towards uh, Daedalus. So he's going to reach that point where the Slater Fist will one shot the Skyrath Mage. 
So Skywrath Mage sees the cheese, has to play completely far back. So while Skywrath Mage can't just the Ember Spirit in the early stages of the game with the fact that the silence will completely shut him down, and in the late stages, if you can get the silence off, Ember Spirit counteracts the Skywrath Mage by instantly killing him. Randomly been committed, 4 star 4 as well as the Hex from Lambda. Diablo has been locked down, the Hex stuff is well turned into a pig, and he takes the falls. Ember Spirit's uh, dot damage from the flame guns able to bring him down. And with a kill outside the tier 3 and with no tier 3 tower up, they, they're they running down mid laners. Very little. The boys from East now can do to try to defend this. Slayer Fist, Saren Chain Combination takes out a third of Death Prophet's life. Pandy's there as well. Ancient Seal being able to lock him down. Mystic Flare over on Veli, but Veli doesn't really give a damn, especially with the Flame Gun. Four stuff forward. Hex over on uh, Caesar Cheese. Track him down. The Whirling Death doing so much work. Mass Open's one. It's dropped defensively. Veli gets takes and falls. Captain Taichu is able to smack him down. So he's able to at least get a retaliatory kill. Sexy Chain. Full stops himself forward, realizing he's up against an O, so decides to back him some way. He's got the overgrowth though. Handy isn't too afraid of the Captain Taichu since he's relying on burst damage from the overpower, and he knows that he's got enough armor to be tanked through the full overpower. So he's chipping away over at the tenth, over at the uh, melee racks. Mass Open wants to be farmed by Sexy in the meanwhile. And with two sets of racks now, it's incredibly difficult for East Knight to be able to recover, especially with their mid game orientated lineup. They're starting to be, play very greedy and go for the tier 3 in the top lane as well, so they're just gonna try to mega mega creep it. Diablo Shadow Blade up, he wants to go in on Lambda River, or Lambda Driver, catches him out, immediately uses the Shadow Dust to ensure the kill over on the line, so he is able to pick him off in the background. Captain Taichu caught out, looks like the B Cranium Bash over and go maybe and ensure the first hit bash. Sexy called up the Shackle, Mystic Flare completely whiffs these cheese on these Mystic Flares being incredibly questionable, he's whiffed almost all of them. And when you're whiffing your Mystic Flare, you lose a huge amount of damage. Captain Taichu buys back, Slack also buys back into the fight. Gomu Gomu caught up in the silence, Exorcism doing a lower one. Diablo's actually able to catch by the Shadow Blade, as well as the Pounce. Should be a kill over on that end. Spooky Scary Skeleton taking a lot of damage, and Pandy, he's hanging around, he's trying to bait out a Spooky Scary Skeleton, so he can turn around with the Chakra and be able to kill him off. Diablo's goes himself forward, but he's got to be very careful. You don't want to chase against a Timber Saw. Sexy runs and throws out the Leaf Seed, and Pandy actually can't get the kill, he's got the Blink Tagger online, and with the Timber Chain, he cuts him down. Great recognition coming out from him. Ursa Warrior TP is in, backs off. Pandy gets another kill. Captain Taichu smacking around Pandy, but with the armor, it's very difficult to bring him down. They should be able to bring him down in the end. But with the Aegis of the Immortal, he's gonna be coming right back. Sexy, he comes too far forward. He's trying to save his uh he's trying to save his offlaner. Fortunately, he takes the fall and Pandy. He's gonna be careful now, but he's got 28 bloodstone charges. He just timber chains himself out to safety. Valley is now there. Slay face Sarah chain combination. Lambda driver comes in, catching out the earth spike. Hex is being used over and take all biddies. The chakram finishes him off. Take all biddies is gonna be taking a fall with the one more slate of fist coming out from Valley. And game three goes in favor of Sync 2. Awesome impressive timber sword play coming out from Pandy. As GG's been called 35 minutes in. And that looks like that's it for tonight. First game, first series to go to a game number three, so I'm fairly happy with that. Sing 2 some very impressive players, some back and forth series of games. Game number 1, Sing 2 were very dominant. Game number 2, East Nug were able to take the initiative and control the tempo of the game. But game number 3, they weren't able to shut down the uh, Timber Saw and the Ember Spirit. Some very impressive uh, RTZ build coming up from Avelli with the Ember Spirit. Using it to lock down here, such as the Skywrath Mage, as, as well as the Ursa. So here's so a you quickly get a pick off or you can kite around. And off the back of that, they were able to win game 3. And Pandy not have, taking a single death that entire game. So that'll be it for tonight. Tomorrow, I believe, will be an entire day full of games. So stay tuned for more. I'll try to upload the VODs by then. But otherwise, that'll be it for tonight.